This past summer, uh, my wife Ruth and I were in Auschwitz. We'd never been there before, and it was well out of our way to get there, but we both knew that we needed to go. In a funny way, we felt that we were drawn there. But of course, we were not alone. Thousands of others were also there that day. And it seems like almost every day it is the same. Thousands of people to bear witness to one of the most outrageous atrocities in human history. And sadly, there is a long list of other places of mass, mass murder and human violence. We took our place in the queue, and eventually a guide took us round and, and spoke to us about different aspects of the place, the history, the people, the rules, the horrors. While we were struck by many things there, for me there were two things that stood out. For others it may be different. But I was struck by the silence of the place. That perhaps sounds strange, given that there were hundreds of people also there at the same time. It was disturbingly silent. Words were offered in hushed tones. Many parts of the tour were simply offered in silence. Even outside the buildings that we were led through, there didn't seem to be any bird song either. The silence seemed to creep into all aspects of the place. It felt like the world around was continuing to grieve over what had taken place, about the death, the violence, the hatred, the destruction of people and lives. The silence hung around the place like a, like a dark cloth, like a veil, like a pall. It's hard to describe, but it was hard to brush off. The second thing that I still carry with me from being in this death camp is the displays of the belongings of those who had been there. Thousands of pots and pans, thousands of suitcases and bags, thousands of haunting pictures, thousands and thousands of shoes, all still there, all still waiting for their owners to return and claim them. But that did not and will not happen. It pointed to the human beings that were involved, not just the, the numbers and the statistics. It spoke of families, of shattered lives, of intentional infliction. It spoke to the level of hatred, of discrimination, of violence, of persecution, of blaming, of evil. Auschwitz and its chimneys and prison-like setting and barbed wire and guard posts and the, the mocking-like greeting in German that translated to, work sets you free and train tracks that, that enter but do not leave. That Auschwitz, for me, is a place that will stay with me forever. Not because I, I want it to be that way, but because I can't let it go. The silence is still with me. The, the lonely possessions are still there. The waiting is still there. The pall is still there. The questions of why or, or how still haunt me, and I hope they always will. For the words of never again need to be given life and breath and room to grow. Today is, of course, Ash Wednesday. Soon we will be marked with ashes we will be reminded that this is an ancient sign speaking of the frailty and uncertainty of human life and marking the penitence of the community as a whole. We need to do this. 
We need to take time out of our, our busy and our complicated lives and simply reflect on life, on death, on silence, on waiting. We need this day to pause and reflect and say, never again, to many things that take place in this world. We need to consider our own lives and invite in absolution to our confession and to offer prayer for how we need to change and be changed, to offer a new way forward and offer genuine response for our contriteness. But Ash Wednesday is not just about this day either. It's bigger and greater. It's larger than us and our place in this world. It's the start of the season of Lent, a a whole season of the church to be set aside and held close, a season of reflection and anticipation, of confession and fasting, as we walk a pilgrimage separate from the rest of the world. Of late, we've been hearing the word quarantine an awful lot on the news, mostly in relation to fears and concerns about the coronavirus and how to protect ourselves and others. It's a worrying time. And of course, the death of many invites us to caution and compassion and concern. I'm not sure why I didn't realize it before. You probably already knew this, but but I hadn't really thought about it. The word quarantine refers to 40 days. 40 days set apart from society, from others, from risk, from concern. Well, we begin a time of 40 days set apart as of today. A time of quarantine, if you will, not in the sense of removed from, but reflecting upon our world, our faith, our life, our death, our priorities, our dreams, our nightmares, our hope, our trust in Christ's death and resurrection. We will mark this day by fasting and almsgiving and prayer and self-examination and scripture and silence and waiting. Forty days set apart to see what God is asking of you and how you might walk a different path, how you might rethink and reconsider decisions or plans or priorities. 40 days to wonder about the actions that have taken place in the history of our world, but also in your own history and your own places of temptation and regret. May this Lent be a holy time for you to know that God is near, that God is beckoning you to enter into this holy time with the sign of ashes an ancient sign speaking of the frailty and uncertainty of human life and marking the penitence of the community as a whole, that God is urging you to wonder about the never-agains in our world, in your life, in your prayers, in your actions, that God is urging you to enter into a deeper silence and a time of prayer-filled waiting that embraces God's presence and God's calling. Forty days set apart. May it be so for you and yours. Amen.